Rising Star Cave, 30 kilometers northwest of Joburg and situated in the cradle of humankind, captures the world's attention today as details of the largest paleoanthropological find in Africa are revealed. Over the past week, we spent time with Professor Lee Berger and his team to capture the unique story behind the discovery. The Rising Star Cave in the cradle of humankind near Johannesburg. About two years ago, a group of uniquely qualified scientists rose the fossil origins of another hominid star to the surface. It all started with two recreational cavers venturing into the dark zone of the well-known Rising Star Cave, discovering the Dinaledi Chamber. Like I said at the time, I was doing auditing, I was caving basically every single weekend. On the night when we actually found the fossils, it was really exciting to find a new section of the cave. When it came to the actual bones, well, we had no clue how important the discovery was. That's it. This discovery resulted in a chain of events and scientific findings that even award-winning and internationally renowned paleoanthropologist Professor Lee Berger considers amazing. I think the rising star discovery on a scale of 1 to 10 would have to go to 11. Because it's got everything that, that someone like me has searched for their entire lives. It's got fossil hominids, which you know, people like me don't find typically, and yet, yet it doesn't just have one or two or a skeleton, more than 1,500 remains and more to be found. Um, it's, it's got everything represented that you could find in a body in multiple ages with males and females, and then it's in this extraordinary circumstance, something that I certainly thought I would never be involved with the study of deep behavior in a primitive hominid because it does appear that they were using this chamber to deliberately dispose of their dead. You know, we were not sophisticated at that stage. We're, we Shortly before the official announcement of the first research experience. results related to the discovery, the media visited the area, learning how a new prehistoric species was added to humankind's family tree. Which you can see the type of entrance. I saw a announcement or a call rather on Facebook that was for a kind of skinny scientist. I needed people with an incredible expertise that very few people have. They had to be first physiologically appropriate. They had to be able to get to a 17 and a half centimeter slot. They then had to have archaeological or paleontological skills with degrees behind it. We set up over three kilometers of cables throughout the system with cameras so at all the difficult, dangerous spots in the cave, so that from outside we could monitor anybody going in and out the cave. We also set up um, cables for telephones, so you could literally get to a point in the cave and pick up a phone, speak to people outside and say, I've arrived safely at this point. One month after actually physically going in and staring down that chute and seeing the final pictures, I and these 60 incredible people with these underground astronauts and all of these other explorers were inside of that chamber recovering fossils. We were very fortunate to be working in fairly loose soil that we were able to essentially brush uh, the, the sediment away from, from those bones. We had to be very careful with them because within a relatively moist environment, they're somewhat um, wet and so it's very easy to actually mark them to have to bring those bones in good condition back to the surface was very difficult and one that we managed by a lot of packing with bubble wrap into plastic boxes then putting them into gear bags that we then sort of semi inflated with air and then just very very carefully moving them person to person. The chute is definitely the most challenging. It goes down to only 18 centimeters vertically. Now, when you're going down it, it's relatively easy because gravity kind of pulls you down. Getting out of it, 
much more challenging. You have to work against gravity through a very tight spot. And then once we actually got into the excavation process and, and I brought up the first material was, was really exciting. When we got into the cave, uh, within that two days, we realized that there were more than one individual. By the end of the week, it was the richest hominid site ever discovered in Southern Africa, really on the continent of Africa. And by the end of 21 days, it was unbelievable. In another unprecedented move, the world was continuously updated on the expedition and the process of analysis was opened to as many as possible scientists. Through our videos on YouTube, through our interviews, through tweeting, through our blogging, we were able to get out to millions of people worldwide. We wanted you and the public to be there with us in this exciting time when young scientists and explorers were taking life and death risks to pull these fossils out of the ground. So that now when we announce them, that everyone was a part of that story. But some of these young scientists found more than fossils. I did uh, find my husband. Uh, I am actually married to Rick Hunter, who is one of the original discoverers of the fossils. And we are actually expecting our first little caver in January. This cave may have been here for millions and millions and millions of years. There'll be dozens and dozens and dozens of research papers by hundreds of scientists that will be coming out over the next years on Naledi as we begin to stay the, more, the greater details of the species. Secondly, we have to make a decision. How much more do we take out of there? Do we leave some of it or all of it for future generations of scientists? And then we need to find more. This cannot be an isolated incident. That's what's next. Who knows? Maybe one of these days, another prehistoric fossil star can rise from this cave. Marisa de Klerk, Joburg, today. The University of the Witwatersrand's fossil vault is home to one of the world's largest hominid collections. Since their excavation at the Rising Star Cave, those fossils also moved in here. That's it. Under the leadership of renowned paleoanthropologist Professor Lee Berger, petite, uniquely skilled scientists first excavated the remains from rather unusual conditions for the cradle of humankind in the cave's Dina Lady chamber. The, the journey in and uh, out of the cave it take anywhere between 20 um, minutes or so uh, to move one direction. Moving down, you're working with gravity. So there's, there's not a lot of work that you have to do. You just control your fall. Coming back out of the chute, it's such an enclosed space that you're unable to bring your knees up and you really can't bend anything to help you. So it's a matter of really just pushing yourself up uh, progressively until you feel your, your toes touching and catching. So normally we have um, these bones that are fossilized in very um, hard blocks, which are called breccia blocks. At Rising Star we didn't have that situation. The fossils were on the surface or just below the surface, but in a mud-like sort of um, environment and not actually rock. So it's a lot easier to pull the actual fossils out from the mud, but um, they are very brittle. Once they were recovered and came up out of the cave, they first went to the science tent on site. And that's where some initial photographs were taken, the catalogue number was recorded. So then the fossils were moved to Vits here, where they were cleaned. More information is taken on them and then they're packaged into little uh, small plastic containers just for storage because, as it turns out, even though this beautiful vault behind us was just built um, just shortly before Rising Star, we've already run out of room. Laser scanning and printing 3D versions help scientists to further study the fossils. First of all, we can scan the fossils uh, for preservation so that we can keep a uh, copy, an exact replica of the fossil in case something should happen to the original. But uh, it also gives us the opportunity to um, reconstruct the animal. And so if we have a, a 3D model printed of the actual specimens, 
um, people can use that to um, look at the specimens and we don't have to worry about them breaking. Um, and the other reason is to get an idea of what the animal would have looked like. They sure would not have looked like humans. They are not humans. They are related to humans, but they are not humans. So, what is different? They have a different face, but a very small head. Just a brain about my fist, and humans have a brain which is three times the fist. So, they are tall, about 1.4 meters high. They have a body which look like humans, especially the legs and the foot, but from the pelvic above we have problems because the trunk does not look like humans. They don't have this enlargement of the chest, which is typical for humans, but they can not do... And that's a very important thing because when you run you have to cool down and that's what we do. But they are rather effective walkers. The hand is special. We have a strong thumb which is human-like, but the muscular insertion are strange. We never saw this in other forms. And what is special is also that the fingers are both. The bones are uh, in, a, in a manner like we see in orangutans. Although the absence of, amongst others, other animal fossils in the Dinaledi chamber slows down dating the bones, it's not holding back other scientific findings. We know probably more about Homo naledi than we do of almost any other primitive hominid species ever discovered because we have so much of it, from infants to babies to young children to tweens to teenagers, young adults to adults to old adults. So we know a great deal about the species. We know how it looked. We also know, though, that it wasn't any normal primitive member, primitive human relative, because it does appear that they were using this chamber to deliberately dispose of their dead. And that's something, until this very moment, we thought was perhaps unique to our species, Homo sapiens. It is expected that these unique fossil findings will make us rethink about what it means to be human. Marisa de Klerk, Joburg Today. Tune into the show tomorrow for more on how you can experience the cradle of humankind. That's it from me. Nishina Mohammed's.